All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're starting session two of the Future Worldcons Q&A. There are note cards at the front, and there should be some in the front row of the back section. If you have a question, write it out on the card and submit it to the high table, because we do vet it for civility. And uh, with that, it's 2.31, so we can go. The first team up is the Seattle 2025 Worldcon. Hi there. Um, our chair, Kathy, cannot be here this week, um, which is unfortunate, and she is missing this experience and is hating every second of that. Um, Worldcon is coming to Seattle in 2025. Um, I'm Sunny Jim. I'm the head of programming for the convention. I'm Kevin Black. I'm the division head for publications. I'm Michelle Morrell. I'm the division head for the exhibits. And thank you so much to everyone who's helped us get here. Um, we are the, the seated convention for next year. We hope to see you in Seattle in the summer of 2025. Um, the team is beyond excited to bring together our local community of learners, doers, makers, and participators within our Worldcon community. And we invite all of you to come and see what the Pacific Northwest community has to offer. Um, we have some amazing guests. They have been announced. They are on our website. Uh, you probably know some of these people, Martha Wells, Donato Giancola, Bridget Landry, and Alexander James Adams. We have a poet laureate just announced, um, Brandon O'Brien, and our hosts are Kay Tempest Bradford and Nisi Shawl. That didn't work properly. <laughs> Sorry, last minute PowerPoint. Um, Worldcon hasn't been in Seattle since 1961. This is a picture from 1961. Um, Things have changed in Seattle <laughs> since 61. <laughs> and uh, we are the home base for a number of exciting industries like aerospace, biotech, software, and gaming. So it's, a, it's an area with a lot of deep expertise and uh, interesting stuff going on. While you're here, you can visit the Museum of Popular Culture, the historic Pike Place Market, the Fremont Troll, all kinds of great uh, uh, things to go do. And we also have fabulous nature and outdoor activities if that's your jam. But you probably want to know more about, for example, our facility. We are in the brand new uh, convention center expansion, which is the Summit Building. It is a purpose-built conference center with five floors that we will be using. So it's a vertically oriented convention center. Um, this is the outside. What you can see there on that picture is what's called the hill climb. So there are escalators and elevators, and alongside the escalators, uh, there are stairs as well and platforms where you can sit and look down out towards the water down that, uh, that diagonal that you can see there on the picture. It's a gorgeous view and really makes it <laughs> pretty cool to, to get around within the space. When you come in on the first floor, there's this large registration area. And here is the floor plan of the first floor. That registration area is, in, uh, is, is right to the right of the orange section. The whole rest of that is a three-floor parking garage within the building. So there is some parking actually inside the building, which will make load-in uh, fairly simple. There's also a large loading dock and loading bay area in the basement with space for whole lot of vehicles and giant freight and cargo elevators, but as well you can access all of the floors of the convention center from the parking garage. So depending on what your vendor or artist or other move in, move out needs are, we've got a lot of ability to accommodate a wide variety of folks. Second floor? Yeah, the second floor is called the Flex Hall and this is where the exhibits hall is going to be. We're going to have um, the art show, the dealer's room, the member lounge, fan tables, and our special exhibits up here. Um, you may think that it doesn't look that big, but if you look way down in the corner, you can see a door that is human-sized. So this is a massive space. It's about 100,000 square feet, which I think came to 9290 square meters, and it's just about the size of the big hall downstairs if it was all, all opened up, all the doors and there's the floor plan. Yes. So uh, the little area off to the top is where we're gonna have the member lounge. That's where we're gonna have food and tables, a photo area, some pinball machine, uh, seating areas and puzzles for people that, that just wanna 
kick back and relax. And then the large area is where we're gonna have the art show and the dealer's room. Um, and as you can see from all of those tables, those are each one of those is 10 by 10 and each aisle is 10 feet wide. So when you go up to the third floor, there is a rooftop garden and a bunch of configurable function spaces. This is half of where the panel programming will be happening. Um, and there's a picture of the rooftop garden from rainy March, the year that the convention center opened, so the plants hadn't really gotten established yet. It's only been open since January of? 23, last year. 2023, so it's been open for a year and a half at this point plants are getting better. And it's still pretty clean. And it's still pretty <laughs> clean. Um, the corridors are wide, it's well lit. There are easy to navigate room numbers for all but three spaces. There's only three named spaces. This is one of my bugaboos. If, if everything has a name, it's hard to know where you're going. But if you're, if you're looking for room 437, it's on the fourth floor and it's between 436 and, and 438. So it's really easy to find everything. Um, here's the fourth floor, which again is just a whole lot of configurable breakout rooms and, and spaces. And then the fifth floor is where our big uh, ballrooms are and the business meeting and um, our headline events. And here's a picture from the opening with our chair, Kathy, in the picture. So she gets to be here a little bit. <laughs> if you are particularly a facility nerd and would like to know more, we do have a uh, video tour on our web, like from our website and on our YouTube that you can listen to the dulcet tones of my voice talking about all the great features of the building, including accessible bathrooms and water bottle filling stations and um, uh, uh, cool stuff like that. So uh, let's skedaddle to Seattle next year and we'll see you there. Uh, what else do we wanna talk about about the convention? We could talk for an hours about the convention, and if you like that, please come by our table, but why don't we take questions from the audience? When will con after dark? Oh, oh yeah, okay, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so the convention center is, of course, expensive to keep open late, so what we're doing instead is when things kind of close down, wind down at the end of the day at the convention center, um, our headquarters hotel, the Sheraton, which is just a couple blocks away, has an entire third floor that we are calling Worldcon After Dark. So you'll find dances, late night readings, gaming, a huge member lounge, a filk den. We have a flex space that'll have different things happening periodically in it. Um, and then a from bar. the third floor, the member lounge, the yep. bar. Um, and then from there, you can go up into the hotel. There's 35 suites, which we are prioritizing the use of those suites for groups that are throwing open parties. So. If you want to throw a party at Seattle, let us know, and we can hook you up with a suite at the Sheraton to do that. <laughs> so that is Worldcon After Dark in Seattle at the Sheraton Hotel. Yes, and we the, the, there's no hotel directly connected, connected to the convention center. We have contracts with five different hotels. They're all within a five-block radius. The reason that's a five-block radius and not a three-block radius was to get one in that's just a little bit cheaper than the others, but it's all downtown Seattle at the height of tourism and cruise season. So the rooms are a little bit spendy. We'll ha we're happy to talk to you about lower-cost options if you, if you want them or need them. And uh, let's take questions. All right, and just it, they're spending because it's cruise season and the hotels get booked out by people jumping yeah, on boats. Yeah, we are. We absolutely are at market rate. I, I, when we were still a bid, it's not my job now, but when we were still a bid, I, I negotiated uh, contracts with the hotels with the help of Visit Seattle, the tourism bureau, which is was very excited and accommodating and wonderful for us. Um, but yes, we're, we, I think, uh, and I don't have it in front of me, we actually do, did publish our list of hotels and room rates on the website over a year ago so that folks would know what they are even though we're anticipating opening the room block in October. Um, but the, the rates are there. I think they range from 220 to $270 a night at our various contracted hotels. American, of course. 
but you've got great public transport, and there's a lot of hotels. Yeah, just so a few uh, stops I mean, away. if you, uh, the the easiest way, so uh, I mean, uh, there's great public transportation all over Seattle, buses and various things. There is a light rail system that uh, leaves from Westlake Mall, which is four blocks from the convention center. You can ride that north to Northgate, which is North Seattle, which is I think half an hour. You can ride it south, roughly south, to the airport area, um, SeaTac area, which is about an hour. Um, but at either of those locations, you can easily get very nice hotel rooms for $100 less than the hotel's rooms that are downtown. Um, if you can stay downtown, I think you're going to love them. We do uh, want and need to fill our room blocks. Um, they're lovely hotels in a lovely location, including our headquarters hotel, the Sheraton. And after you've had fun all day, who wants to jump on light rail for some journey somewhere? Just pony up and go back to your room. You'll love it. And, of course, there's Airbnbs, and there's backpackers, and all kinds of other things. All right. Speaking of light rail and streets, somebody wants to know what's the status on unhoused people in the streets or drug use, general safety in that area of town, certainly. I think, um, well, go ahead. so, yes, Seattle does have an unhoused population. I think that... The area around the convention center has a lot less of that. It just doesn't, uh, they, they don't tend to congregate in that neighborhood as much. So I wouldn't be too worried about street crime or having to, you know, step over people on your way places. It's not that part of town. Um, which yeah, I mean, like a lot of cities, there's homeless issues in Seattle. Um, that most of the services, uh, the downtown emergency service center and shelters and so forth are, this, are in the south area of downtown Sodo. This is not Sodo. This is right by the, uh, the expressway. Um, so I, it's not some, it, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to be an impediment or a concern. So what you're saying is I can't get good drugs near the convention center. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'd have to go a little okay. farther for the All good right. drugs. Well, I'm not doing that because I'm staying in one of the hotel blocks. So. <laughs> Is there a sci-fi museum in Seattle? There is. It is now called the Museum of Popular Culture, although I think colloquially a, a lot of people still call it the Science Fiction Museum. It originally opened as the Experience Music Project and Sci-Fi Museum. Um, two separate doors and two separate tickets. Those are merged now. Yeah, it was, it was one, one building, ticket. and now it's one ticket to get you into the whole building, and they have uh, a bunch of exhibits. And from where we are in the convention center, it's a couple blocks down to West Lake where you can catch the monorail left over from the 1962 World's Fair um, and one of the only profitable public transit systems in the country. And you it literally can, goes through the museum. And it goes through the museum and, it, and the monorail literally goes one place. It goes from West Lake to Seattle Center and back yeah. again. That's all it does. I think the round trip ticket is, is $5 and you seven should ride now. seven now. <laughs> Don't come to Seattle. No. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a fun ride even if you're not going to Seattle Center, and you should. And you yep. should. But yeah, that'll take you straight to the Science Fiction Museum. <clears throat> and once you get there, there's also the Dale Shalhouli Museum right there. If you like glass, they have um, KEXP, one of our largest independent radio stations, has, uh, has their live broadcast there, so you can go in and watch the DJs. It's the Space Needle. Place. The Space Needle. Mm -hmm. That little thing. So how long is the trip? Could you take over a car and do a programming item on your way to the Sci-Fi Museum? It's only a couple minutes. Oh, I've, I've no. walked it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's about a mile and a half. Yeah. Well, I think it's just quick a quick program anyway. item. No. <coughs> All right. Um, are you and you're with program anticipating any efforts, initiatives to encourage former Worldcon guests of honor or chairs to participate in programming? You know, uh, there's. There's always the opportunity for that. It hasn't been a plan so far, but now that it's okay. been suggested, that's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> and then there's an, well, I'm, there's part of it I'm excluding on that one question. But uh, are you going to make any special efforts to highlight local authors in joining programming? And there wouldn't be any restriction for them as opposed to any other author trying to apply for programming? No, um, we, our, our program team is 
largely local, so I think that there will be a skewing and maybe a slight bias in favor of local authors. Mm -hmm. so you gotta show off the locals. So. Right, we're gonna show off the local folks. Um, there's a lot of them. We have a really vibrant author community in the Pacific Northwest. It's rainy and grim a lot of the year, uh, not in the summertime, but like October through June, it, it pretty much is gray, so people read a lot, and there's a lot of writers, and and it really fosters that uh, that community well. And then also for the past two years, I've been um, shilling the con to any artist or vendor I find who's yeah. local that I think fits in uh, with the science fiction and fantasy or mm -hmm. our genre. So we do hope to have a robust local dealer and artist section as well too. Yeah, and there's a lot of local cons, so it's a big community and yeah. they're all coming. We, we wanna show you what Seattle can bring to the community. All right, this is obviously a program participant's own experience because anecdotally they say a number of program participants this year had trouble using and filling out Planorama. And are you all thinking of any steps to smooth that process in simplifying participation? Um, well, we're not using Planorama, although Planorama is cool. Um, we're using a, a different purpose-built system that was built for NorwestCon. Unfortunately, probably none of you have ever used it. It's called Convivius. Uh, because only NorwestCon has used it. Its developer built this great thing and then kind of the last like 3% never happens, so it's not available to the rest of the world, but it totally works and I love it. Um, there's some features about it that I think panelists will find easier to navigate. Um, there's not this need to log in every time, um, so you don't have to remember your password or remember which email you used for it. Um, and it's just, it's configured a little bit differently. I'm biased, it's kind of based on the way I think, so I think it's brilliant and perfect, and why would you do it any other way? And that's the way they're gonna be doing and it. And that's so. what we're gonna be doing, so. It was built around her process when she yeah. was director of program for NorwestCon. Yeah. Any other questions? It is. Don't park in downtown Seattle. Um, I mean, if you're a vendor, obviously, there you might need to. But, uh, but um, my advice for people who would be driving to Seattle would be to actually look at long-term parking. Where, uh, there's a lot of uh, places near the airport um, to do long-term parking. You can park your car, you can get a rate, you can get a group on, you, there's a lot of coupons and things, you can do that. Um, park your car, get on the light rail, take it into, uh, into the area, you will not need a car. In fact, a car will be a liability for getting around town once you're downtown. And if you do decide to just park a car for uh, five or six days in Seattle, expect to pay uh, $60 plus per day, even if you're parking at the mm -hmm. hotel that, you've, that you're also staying at. I think especially if you're parking at the hotel. There are some places that are a little bit less than that, um, but the hotels really seem to um, crank, uh, crank the price up over business parking. There are apps you can get um, on your phone that help you find the best parking prices, and if you're lucky, you can find a spot for about $30 a day, but that's if you're lucky. But uh, also, once you're in our area, you will not need a cart for shopping, for tourism, for food, for anything else. There's, uh, if for some reason you needed, you know, there's buses and so on that are very easy if you need to go further than a short radius, which would only be for special purposes. I think the next time we do this, or we'll start with Dublin, is when anyone makes a move, I just saw Joyce, like, and I'm <laughs> like, I'm gonna use auction rules and go, okay, you, no. <laughs> You've gotta ask a question. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Miles just <laughs> You know, that's a great question. Um, we did add some to our room block and I, after, or maybe at the last second, so I'm no longer the division head for facilities, so you should probably direct that to either info at or facilities at. Um, we do have a certain number of suite upgrades that came with our contract, and so um, a certain number of people uh, may, if they're throwing open parties, uh, may be able to get 
upgraded to a suite on our contract just by the price of a room in the room block. Um, others might have to pay full freight for the suite. And I'm afraid I don't have that information, but I think we can get it to you. Part of it is curiosity of how early would you recommend trying to bid for a suite if you are planning to do an open house? Yeah, and there are, there are also classes of suites too. I think there's like four, I mean, there's we have several different properties, but there's like some presidential suites that are like 6,000 a night, and that's like a very small number of them, and most of them are quite a bit less than that, but also expensive. And again, uh, we'll have to get back to you on that. And if you are thinking about throwing a party, just know that all of the parties will be at the Sheraton. So even though the other hotels have suites, um, those hotels are not particularly amenable to inviting other people into your room. Well, that's uh, all open parties will yeah. be at the Sheraton. The other, ho the high, the other, the three of the other hotels with suites are all Hyatt's, so it's one contract with the Hyatt Group. Hyatt Group did not want to negotiate about corkage and forkage and any of that stuff, and so um, I think if you're a closed door thing and you're doing things closed, you can do what you want. But uh, open parties, you'd have to negotiate that with the Hyatt, and they would want to cater your party for eye-watering amounts of money. Um, so, uh, but the Sheridan, uh, no corkage, no forkage, um, elevators will be open for people who, uh, aren't staying at the Sheridan, uh, they're extremely flexible and very nice. But and you should probably email in sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, that yeah. speaks to the secondary question of, so has any thought been put into elevators and lines? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that was... How many elevators are there at there's, the Sheridan? There's two separate <laughs> elevator banks. Yeah. yeah I think and it's banks four and four. Yeah. 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 There's yeah. there's there's banks on two sides of the building, and there's at least three, hotels. if not four or more, on each one. I think one of them is eight because I think it has. We the two we'll sides. have to get back to you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's also an escalator up to the third floor, which is our after dark program area. I mean, one of our hotels, the Hyatt, was just put up in 2018. The Hyatt, well, that's either, I think it's the Hyatt that's Grand. The there's the Hyatt Grand, the Hyatt Regency. Well, one or the other. Anyway, um, so they're modern hotels, but uh, Sheraton is our headquarters and our party yeah. hotel. I mean, and I'm, I'm excited to hear that Jonathan's throwing an open party in Seattle. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> if you need in, I know a guy. So. I was going to say, hey, can you get me on that list? <laughs> yeah, he'll have good booze in his car. So. All right, is there anybody else with, is this a Seattle query? Okay. Um, Just go ahead and okay. ask your guy. I, I've never attended a, a busy, kind of like a world con where the elevators couldn't break down in the hotel. Um, it seems like, is there any fix to that? Like, if you ask in the hotel, I'm not going to say that the elevators will not break down because I'm not sure this is real wood, but um, I mean our convention center was built in 20, finished building in 2023. Our facilities are very modern. Um, there's, we don't have pinch points where we're lying on, on only one or two elevators. So I don't think this is going to be an issue. Yeah, the Sheraton is a little bit older, it's been around longer, but again, they have multiple banks of hotel, or of elevators. So I think there's enough flexibility there that if you can go to the other end of the hall, but you know, it, it's definitely on our radar. I take stairs a lot. Right, and in the, in the convention center during the day, there's two banks of elevators and there's two banks of escalators. So if you can take an escalator, they're on both sides of the building, and then there's additionally the stair, the, the hill climb, so the stairs up that one can take if one is, you know, feeling exuberant. And you all did negotiate with the hotels that everything's downhill, right? <laughs> both both directions. Both, both yeah, ways. Both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Downhill both ways. Okay. But I, no, I, um, so the summit actually, I've been telling people it is um, the top of the rise from from. Puget Sound, so Puget Sound goes, and then it's on Ninth Avenue is basically our location, which means there's a 365 degree view of beautiful things in every direction, two mountain ranges, 
three major bodies of water, the whole downtown skyline. It's really cool. Um, but, uh, but the, you know, sort of three block, really, radius that we'll be in is not flat as a board, but it's pretty flat. And it, these are not It's gently flats. sloped. It's, it's, it's at most gently sloped. There are other parts of Seattle where if you drive a stick shift, it's challenging, that are only like five blocks, four blocks away. This is not that part. This is a newbie stick shift driver is fine in this part of downtown. Yeah, we have two national parks within driving distance, by the way, Mount Rainier National Park and, uh, and Olympic National Park. You'll see the uh, Olympics on one side, the Cascades on another side. Um, it's bright, it's blue skies and sunshine in August. And as I was asked, yes, you can drive to Forks within a day mm -hmm. and see all the sparkly vampires. Seeing no more movement, we're going to go going once, twice, three times. Thank you, Seattle. waiting for me to get myself <laughs> out of your way. <laughs> and also, we're very nice to all of our members of this convention. Yeah. Even the slow ones. <laughs> Especially the slow ones. Okay. All right, everyone, Dublin 2029. We have Brian Nesbitt and Marguerite Smith. Even easier. Thank you. Excellent. It's delightful to see everybody. Hi. I'm Marguerite, and I am one of the co chairs for the bid for Dublin in 2029. And I'm Brian, and I'm also one of the co chairs for the bid for Dublin in 2029. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be here at Glasgow 2024. Um, we have to, we're volunteers of the committee. Um, <laughs> but um, especially letting you know, um, some of you are already aware, but of our desire to bring Worldcon back to Dublin. Uh, we had a great experience, and we know that many of you did as well in 2019, and we'd really like to build on that. Um, you know, we know that we've presented it par par prior, Q&A sessions, but now that we're here in Glasgow, we're five years out, um, it's really time to step it up, which is quite clearly why we've been massively distracted for the last two years, but yeah, details, details, details. Um, but first off, we'd really like to formally um, reveal our bid logo, uh, done for us by the wonderful Siobhan Fraser, biased, she's my wife, uh, but also she's wonderful. Um, and so, da da Ooh. Ah. Okay. Yes, it is um, absolutely wonderful. We both love it. Uh, we worked very hard with Siobhan to talk about the things that we see in Worldcon. We want to reflect that crossroads, the joining of science fiction and fantasy and how it can take us to new worlds or how it can help us reflect on our own as it exists. Um, you know, and we wanted to honor the past while looking towards the future. And of course, it has to represent Dublin and have a little bit of flair as well. Um, and Siobhan took this total nonsense of mouth verbiage and uh, turned it into this beautiful, this beautiful logo that you see above me. Um, you will very easily recognize the insular letter, the big D, just like the, the Book of Kells. Um, but 
We've also brought in something a little bit more modern with Louis de Broquy, the artist, uh, does figurine drawing, much like the, our, our scrappy little person going on an adventure. Um, but we've also got what looks like woodcut art, but we're going to a futuristic planet. It's a mix of all of those things that we love about Worldcon and about this community. So, as with any place that's, uh, that's bid more than once, uh, we know that means that celebrating the things that went well, while obviously looking to improve the things that, that didn't. Um, and we're lucky in that we were both division heads on the committee in 2019, um, as both being on the committee here in Glasgow, and for a few other cons in between. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of lessons that we're not just having other people tell us that we have, we have learned personally, um, and in some cases still have the scars. Um, and also we've received firsthand the feedback that was given. So this is a map of the kind of the area around our primary space, which is the convention center in Dublin, which was where our primary venue was in 2019. The, and it is still a state-of-the-art convention center. They continue to win awards for European convention center and world convention center pieces, and they continue to be an amazing bunch of people to work with. We've had several meetings with them so far and several, you know, Ex, you know, talking about it, thinking about it. Um, in the upper left-hand side, from, from um, your point of view, um, you have the National College of Ireland, which is the second large venue site that we are looking at for the convention. Um, so that is a third-level college in Ireland. It is designed to have lecture theatres and students moving around it. Um, it is somewhere in the region of 500 metres from, from door to door, which is four to 500 metres, 450 exactly, I think, is the last time I measured it. Um, so it's roughly half, those of you who are in Dublin 2019, it's roughly half the distance uh, that it was from the Point to the Gibson and the Point Village area in 2019. Uh, we're also looking at using some of the hotels between those two sites as well. So we're really shrinking down um, the area that, that, that we're going to be running the, uh, the convention in. And it is step, you know, it's, it's, it's step free across it. It's the good pavements there. Uh, you have to cross one road um, with multiple crossing points on it as well. Um, and as I said, we'll, we, we'll be expecting to use some other hotels um, both between them and, and in the area. There's been a huge bunch of, um, of building in, in that area. Um, and before anyone asks, because people have, um, obviously with any, with any event, with any event in a constrained space, if we need to cap the numbers of the convention, we will, but that is very, very far away from our thinking at this point in time. It's far too early, this far out to, to consider it, but obviously it is something that you know, is there as a possibility should we need to. Yeah, so some of the other things that we are looking at, we had feedback around um, the online convention. It's becoming more common. Obviously, this wasn't really a thing in 2019, but has now become a normal aspect of any convention. So we're looking at the different ways that it is managed, the different tools that are used, accessibility options, and just making sure that we are always adapting based on the feedback that we're getting. Just because we've done something once before doesn't mean we have to do it the same way again. But also, let's not reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. So let's make sensible changes and go through. Um, some of the other feedback we have gotten at multiple conventions include things like the visa process, uh, which many people don't have to go through. But for those that do, it can be quite an impediment to really joining in with the on-site Worldcon experience. Um, other things that we're looking at would be uh, really working with local government and arts grants and you know funding sponsorship opportunities with a guideline in place of what kinds of sponsorship we'll take to ensure that we're funding accessibility appropriately, funding community appropriately, and just coming in to build all of that right from the ground up. Um, we're also trying some 
more unusual things, or at least thinking about it. Things like how, if you have two sites, what do you do? Do you have your art show on one side and your dealer's hall on the other? Or do you have a little dealer's hall and an art show and a little dealer's hall and an art show? We don't know yet, but we'll find out. You know, This is part of the fun of doing something new with new sites and new venues. Uh, we get to try and we get to, to see what works. So if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is where our progress is at the moment. As Brian said, we're talking to two venues very specifically. The first is the CCD. Those of you who were in Dublin in 2019 have been there, you've experienced it. They claim to have space for 8,000 people, but we know that's only if you give up all of that ground floor space and there is no exhibit and there is no dealer's hall and there is nothing. That's not how we want to run our Worldcon. So we've said it's approximately 6,000 people. Our auditorium is a dedicated 2,000 person hall. Uh, but then because we are also talking to the NCI, we've got almost another 1,050 seats in those lecture style, theater, classroom formations, great for lectures and talks and panels. And there's another space for 350 people in the atrium, which is this glorious glass-covered uh, walkway. Beautiful natural light, covered from the elements because it's still Dublin, even if it is August. So looking at it, you know, our new numbers are something more like 3,400 people, which is the other reason we're not really looking at capping yet. Let's look at these new venues with the new numbers and see where we go with that. So we're also working, as I said, with Folcha, which is the Irish Tourist Board. We're working with Dublin City Council. We even happen to have an ex-councillor on our team who is going to help us, you know, give us the grant advice. He can't do it for us, obviously, for, for uh, conflict of interest reasons, but uh, we've got expert, expert help on this. Um, and, of course, we have... Uh, lots of support across the island. We have fans who want to see this happen again. They were so excited to bring Worldcon and to bring Worldcon fandom to Dublin. We want to do it again. And we've got uh, people giving up their time here at this convention to sit our table, both in the dealer, or the exhibits hall and online. Um, we've got people helping us throw our party, which we will have more details on. Um, and we've seen just this huge outpouring of support. Uh, for those of you who don't know, EasterCon next year, which is the UK National Convention, is being held in Belfast. It's about an hour's ride away on the train, and so we're working very closely with them. We've got a lot of goodwill on the island, across, even from those in Cork. Um, <laughs> for those who don't know, much like uh, Brisbane and Sydney were a thing earlier, Dublin and Cork are kind of, there, there's Cork and there's not Cork. Um, so, so, yeah, we've seen a bunch of new supporters as well, which we are super grateful for. And indeed, um, we have the fan table, and thank you for those of you who visited so far, and we'd say come down and visit. Um, we are doing everything online, so all the pre-support stuff is through the website, um, uh, so just be there, but we have lots of QR codes for you to look at if, you know, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, but we're down there, we have our party on um, Saturday night, which will be in Hall 4, um, at a, starting around roughly around 8 o'clock. In Wonderfully, the amazing LA people are giving us their tent for the night. Um, something about Irish people going to America, getting housed, yeah, it's a whole thing. Um, into the West. Um, <laughs> and we will be, um, yes, um, and we will, where am I going? Yes, party Saturday night. I, I'm awake. Um, the Irish Video Games Orchestra performance on Sunday. We're really proud to be the sponsor of that on Sunday afternoon. It's going to be amazing if you haven't heard them before. And even if you have heard them before, they're still going to be amazing. We have ribbons, shiny, sparkly ribbons. Um, if, you, if you do not have one, please, we can give you one after this, or you can go down to the table or accost us somewhere in the halls. Um, and we will be... Yeah, um, and we're happy to answer questions there or here. Um, I think then we're on to... 
Are we talking about the... Oh, yeah, no, cool. uh, was there one more slide, uh, or did I stick? Did I forget that I had put this slide in? Ah, there? yes. Okay, so the, yes, the, these okay, are the... I these had forgotten what slide I had put in. Um, so yes, these are the pre-support levels for those of you who don't want to go look at the website just now. Uh, pre-support donation, gratefully received, will go towards all bid activities. Nice round 20 euro. Uh, for those born on or after the 1st of January 20... Sorry, 2004 which feels like <laughs> yesterday, but will be for those who are 25 or under as of time of convention. Uh, we have a 75 euro uh, friend membership. Um, for those born a little bit earlier, uh, it's 150 instead. What those give you is essentially our eternal gratitude, uh, maybe some extra nice sparkly things, and not too many because we have to save some for the super friends um, and the uh, conversion the too. conversion the attending supplement uh, so you will still have to provide your own WUSFIS membership uh, but we will cover the attending supplement and for those of you who definitely have more money than cents first come please join our team uh, yeah. but also we have the super friend uh, donation which is 350 euro same thing you will get the same things that the friends get plus those extra sparklies maybe some handwritten letters things like that uh, but uh, the rest is also a donation to the bid gratefully received Marguerite's handwriting is much nicer than mine <laughs> um, and so kind of what's next um, we're going to, we're arranging, we just need to finalize the dates. We'll have a, we'll have a venue tour and a bit of a kind of a meeting um, in Dublin in uh, the late September, early October. We're, we're just finalizing that and seeing if we can link it up with the Irish National Convention, which takes place in early October. Um, we're here, we have a table. We're going to be going to Rotterdam uh, next weekend for Eurocon. Um, we, will, we will be present there. We'll be present, of course, at Octacon, our national convention, dear to very, very dear to both of our hearts. Um, we'll be at Smothcon, we'll be at Eastercon in Belfast, we'll be in Seattle, and in Seattle we'll have a slide which will contain many of the same conventions that we're going to be at uh, again at that point in time. So we're very much going to be around. Um, exactly, and, and we will keep working, we'll keep building out the team. You will see more names come onto the slide as time progresses. Uh, and one of the ways to make sure that you're staying up to date with information, which I promise will actually start happening now that I won't be as busy with this, uh, is we do have a mailing list on our website as well. So you can sign up to be notified just as we as we go along. Um, we'll, do, we'll, we'll do some more social media. Exactly. As well. We've got some, it's, we'll, 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 it's a tricky time for what social media is you're yeah. doing, but yeah. We'll work it out and we will be sure to be public about where we are so that we are very transparent and sharing information. And I think, I mean, ultimately, you know, we want to bring Worldcon back to Dublin um, to bring even more Dublin to Worldcon. Yeah, and, and just both of us, you know, for, for in fact, both of us, our first Worldcon was Glasgow in 2005. Uh, so 20 years, 40 years, well, 40 years between us of Worldcon attendance. Um, we just want to make sure that that experience keeps going forward and more people get to experience that. So I think established or new, we want to make sure that everybody's welcome. Yeah. And just as someone who attended Dublin in 2019, it was impressive, the number of Irish fans who were involved. Uh, very refreshing, it's fun. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, European con running is in a really good place and, and Irish con running is, is, is very much part of that and we really want to, to not just get what's there but bring in the new people who are who have the same weird addictions that we have and, and want to do this kind of thing. So the super friend level, any chance of actual superpowers, even if it's Marv Marvin and Wendy and um, that's <laughs> we might be able to get you a cape. Would that qualify? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tricolor we'll, we'll capes. Make them of, are, are uh, yeah, tricolor capes. We might even manage to get like uh, potato wrappers and just, <sighs> which are potato crisps, um, make a <laughs> yeah. cape out of those. <laughs> All right. I'm going to, this question came in, so I'm going to ask it, but I'm going to preface it in that I think you pretty much answered it, but you can niggle at any additional detail. The comment was that it felt crowded in the facilities in 2019. 
You know, there are additional facility opportunities to spread out panels or other ways to mitigate the issue, shrink rays or anything like that. And I mean, I think, you know, N NCI is our, is our main plan there. Mm -hmm. It was actually something that we, we looked for for 2019, but it was too late in the day. Um, so at this point in time, we're, you know, we're, we're talking to them already. Uh, it, is, it is a university or, you know, so it has those, those positions and will be better for panel spaces than, um, than a cinema, which was, you know, was one of the, the areas of crowding. So that wasn't a bad usage, though. Was it was the in and out. The, the, yeah. the way in and out was, was not ideal, so whereas the, the college is built for it. So that's our big thing. There are also, I mean, there's been a lot of building in that area of the city, um, and we're certainly not going to cut off any opportunities while still very much wanting to stay with that smaller campus feel for the venues. Yeah, and I think we've seen some other initiatives as well, just as we've seen here, having one-hour panel slots in an hour and a half suddenly changes the amount of flow and the amount of queuing that starts happening. So there, it's not just the facilities, although we are also looking at that, but it's the other ways in which we can mitigate queuing that we're also paying attention to and making sure to include. I see no movement in the room. That was the only question that was submitted to you. you can oh. So there's no hotel attached to the convention center. Um, however, there are, I think we just looked, Actually, something like 24,000 24, hotel yeah. room spaces in Dublin. There's a large number of hotels within a couple of hundred meters. There's three hotels within a few hundred, me mm -hmm. you know, a few hundred meters. There are another N at less than a kilometer's distance. And you know it goes on and on from there. So just um, there are lots of hotels there flat that entire area of the city because it's right on the river it's very flat very walkable it's also right there by the tram system public transport so very accessible um, and I mean there's there has been a lot of hotel building in Dublin uh, this is a interesting political thing where we would like them to build some more apartments and houses now and again but certainly a lot more and indeed a lot of that's been aimed at more budget pieces um, I pass a new budget hotel that was only completed last winter on my way into work, which is the same loop, the same tram track that goes down to the venue. So there's a lot of options there and a lot of very easily accessible options. So I, I, the reason I brought up the map is that is probably the closest hotel that we have or that we are likely to have that is in the area, uh, which is the Spencer. So you can see it is essentially adjacent to the NCI and is 300 meters away from the front entrance of the CCD. But the street level trams worked really well. I was at a hotel that was down towards the point. Yeah. It was yeah. super simple, walked out, popped down to the center, easy peasy. And at this point in time, and we hope they won't change it much, but any 90 minute trip on Dublin public transport at this point in time um, with, a, with a card, you know, we, we, and you can get these cards, or the, the tourist cards or otherwise, uh, will cost no more than two euro for any 90 minute trip across any multiples of public transport usage. Um, yeah, so if it's multiple trains, multiple buses, the Lewis, yeah. as long as you're within that 90 minutes, it should cost no more than two euro. And bike schemes and all those other things as well. So. As you said, there was a road that people might have to cross. Yes, so just at the base here, you can see that, that there is this walkway, there's one a particular intersection because this coming down this way which you can't see is the Samuel Beckett Bridge you may recognize it as the sort of the inverse harp shape um, coming from the front of the CCD over here and walking across there, there are essentially two ways to get there right because it's the opposites of a, a rectangle you can come across this walkway here and then head up the road that from my arms and not home. Thank you. Um, or you can, and it's a very nice walk. I walk on along this way um, on my way to work sometimes. Uh, come down by the canal, make your way up to Mayor Street, cross one intersection there, and then make your way to NCI. Uh, th that bit there is just a very small laneway. It's yeah. not, a, no, not a full road. But yeah. Absolutely not, unfortunately. No, it, it, is, it, is it is a, a main thoroughfare in the city, but genuinely the lights, the light sequences are very, the, you know, the pedestrian lights are very positive. Um, I, we both cross that road quite a lot and you're never waiting 
more than maybe a minute for the for the lights to change effectively. So. But I mean, your point is well taken. What we can do is we can say, I can't promise they'll take us seriously, um, but we can say, look, we know that we are going to have an additional, fingers crossed, seven thousand people coming to this intersection that is already a busy intersection. Can we? change the sequence they won't shut the, the street That's down right, yeah. but be yeah let's let's it's in their interest to not to have yeah a crowd i mean i think it's it you know one one thing that's important to realize is that walking route as well past the convention center brings you down to the point theater which is the biggest indoor um the biggest indoor arena uh, in the city so it's a very well-traveled route for thousands of people down to conventions or in the case of Taylor swift concerts for her merch stand she took the largest indoor arena for her merch stand. That is an impressive flex, and I am in awe of it. <laughs> if I could do it, I would. But I don't think our it's merch, no, we're responsible. That, our merch will be, we'll put our merch in the point. Take off the whole thing as our merch stand. <laughs> there you go. I know, Joyce, I know Joyce Lloyd once got the city of San Antonio to change crosswalk sequence <laughs> in like 90 minutes. So. Cool. Get Joyce to sort that out. Nice. So Joyce, the, the, would, you like us to, would you like to be our crosswalk <laughs> officer? Yeah. The short story was in 2013 at the morning gripe session, uh, day one. The guy stands up and said, oh, the crosswalks and terminal over there are going between the hotel and the convention center. Can't we do something to shorten that up? And I'm you know, making the list or we'll check on that. And I'm thinking, oh, there's no way they're changing the crosswalk. I called Joyce and she calls me back a few minutes later and said, yeah, within 90 minutes, somebody's gonna be out and they'll change the timing on that. And it was changed quite noticeably, it was much better. Okay. But so it's free to ask. I get you know always ask. Exactly. You never know. So don't ask, don't get. Yeah. Well, we got it. it was like <laughs> Any other questions for Dublin in 2029? Once, twice, three times, finished. Cry to Marguerite. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Come to our party. Yeah. <laughs> Any bids announced from 30 and beyond, and we hope to hear of them because we like to go to world cons, are probably aspirational at this point. Um, I look at, and I would be involved in the 2031 Texas bid, which is being chaired by Sarah Felix. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say Sarah Felix is the chair Sarah, for the? Sarah, yeah, okay. Who's the chair again? Sarah Felix. What's Sarah Felix doing? She's chairing the 2031 world con bid for oh. Texas. Oh, she's chairing the committee. Not only is she on it, she's chairing it. This is great. This is all on film, so we'll have. No, she is. She's enthusiastic. She's got a lot of great ideas. Uh, at this point, well, I'll let Jonathan speak because I'm tired of hearing my voice. So Jonathan Miles is going to. I'd like some... to be dragged in to help uh, fighting as best I can. Oh, we are currently evaluating options of the cities of Texas. I know that you'll ask. Yeah, Sarah Felix. Yeah. yeah. She's a Hugo finalist, too. 
artist oh. artist yeah oh the very it's, it's a renaissance moment that's you know and just just for the online audience to summarize if you didn't hear what jonathan was saying that the texas bid is still examining several cities to come up with the best option um, the vote's still some year ways out there's not an actual formal declaration yet but um, 2031 is their intended because it worked well with sarah felix the chair schedule so 2031 <laughs> A lot of thought went into it. So, if is there anyone for any other year? 2030, 32, 33? No? All right. Those of you out here listening in the internet, start thinking about getting a bid together. We're good. All right. With that, I'm going to say so long, farewell, and go to these bid parties and visit their bid tables and consider to volunteer for these conventions. They don't happen without the efforts of many. So. Thank you very much.